Okay, in this video we're going to cover Chapter 2, Section 4 in our Algebra 2 class. Again, we are actually discussing linear equations right now, which should have been covered in Algebra 1, but in the, in the event that you haven't seen this information, it's nice to get all on the same page. The objective for this lesson and this video is to write equations of lines in different formats <clears throat> and to establish the slope and y-intercept of a linear function, again, given in different formats. We're going to be talking about the point-slope form, the standard form, and the slope-intercept form that we covered in the last video, as well as what it takes to be parallel and perpendicular lines. The common core standards that, cover, that are covered in this video, or at least touched upon in this video, are listed here as well. So, in general, two lines are said to be parallel in a plane if they never touch or cross. Now, in a plane means that uh, the two lines are kind of flat next to one another. I don't have one that's pointing up in one direction and then floating away from it in another direction. In fact, I can't even show that on this flat screen, but hopefully that makes sense to you. We're, we're in the same flat surface. <clears throat> Pretend we're drawing two lines on a single sheet of paper. That sheet of paper is a plane. So two lines will be parallel if they're in the same plane and they never touch or cross one another. Two lines are said to be perpendicular in a plane if they touch or cross at a 90 degree angle. When we plot our lines on a Cartesian coordinate system, the slopes of these lines can help us determine whether these lines are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. So if you recall, the slope of a line can be computed using two coordinates and this formula. Slope m is equal to the y value of the second coordinate minus the y value of the first, divided by the x value of the second coordinate minus the x value of the first. <clears throat> we called this the difference in y's divided by the difference in x's. If we rearrange this equation, we can establish the point-slope form of a linear equation. So again, as a reminder, the slope-intercept form of an equation looks like this. That's the one that said y is equal to m times x plus b. But the point-slope formula is going to look a little bit different. What I'm going to imagine is what would happen if I took this denominator, this x2 minus x1, and if I multiply it on both sides of the equation. So I've just rewritten it down here to give myself a little bit more room. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, if I've multiplied both sides of the equation by this x2 minus x1, I can imagine that this is a fraction over 1, uh, what would happen is the x2 minus x1 will actually cancel on this right side of the equation and it will effectively move to the left. And a lot of times if we have a coefficient or a number that's multiplying or distributing into a, a group of parentheses like this, we'll report it this way. We'll say that m is multiplying by x2 minus x1, and that's equal to what's left behind, y2 minus y1. And there we have what I would call my point-slope form of a linear equation. But I'm going to clean it up just a little bit. So in our point-slope format, instead of using the subscript of 2 and the subscript of 2 for x and y in both of those locations, I'm just going to change those back to the letter x. Because whether we're talking about a, a second coordinate in a pair or the third coordinate in a triple, uh, you name it, it doesn't matter what our end point is, the x and the y is going to represent the uh, potential for any x or y within the equation. So I'm going to take away that subscript. And then I'm also going to write the y values on the left side. This is pretty typical of how this is reported. So instead of y2 minus y1, we have just plain y minus y1 equals m times plain x minus x1. And this is the traditional definition for our point-slope form of a linear equation. You can see how it's similar but slightly different from the slope-intercept. The uh, y-intercept is not provided in the point-slope formula. Instead, we have actual coordinates x1 and y1 uh, elsewhere in the, uh, in the line that are represented in the equation. So here's an example. <clears throat> if we have a line that passes through this coordinate and has a slope of 3 fifths, can we determine the slope-intercept equation of the line? I would say yes, but we have to start with a point-slope formula. Point-slope formula says uh, y minus y1 must be equal to m times x minus x1. 
Now, x1 and y1 come from the coordinates. We have an x1 value and a y1 value. And the slope comes from our slope that's given to us in the problem. So if I replace these three values, these three variables, with these three values, then we should be able to simplify and have our slope-intercept form of the equation. So it'll look something like this. y minus 2 is equal to m, which is 3 fifths, times x minus negative 5. To simplify, I'm going to clear the parentheses first. On the left side, there's nothing that needs to be done. y minus 2 is just the same as y minus 2 without the parentheses. On the right side, I'm going to work from the innermost parentheses out. If I have to subtract a negative 5, that's the same as adding 5. So we'll change it to x plus 5. And then again, to simplify and clear out the parentheses, I'm going to consider distributing in this 3 fifths. Now, 3 fifths times x is just that, 3 fifths x. 3 fifths times 5, whoops, 3 fifths times 5 is equal to 3. And we can check that with a calculator if we need to. We'll create an empty fraction. 3 divided, whoops, 3 over 5, 3 divided by 5 times 5 is equal to 3. It's just slightly off my screen here. Let's see if I can fix that. Here we can see the result. 3 fifths times 5 is indeed 3. So we're almost there now. Um, the last thing that we'll need to do in order to get y by itself, since that's a part of our point slope, I'm sorry, our slope intercept format, is we'll add 2 to both sides. It cancels on the left, and we now have 3 fifths x plus 5. And there is the slope intercept format of the equation that goes through this coordinate and has a slope of 3 fifths. In the next example, we're essentially asked the same thing. What is the equation of a line that passes through these two points? Well, as we've seen so far, um, points are helpful, but we also need to know the slope in between them. So let's go ahead and calculate slope first. Slope is the result of the difference in the y values divided by the difference in the x values. So in this case, uh, we would have... Uh, let's say 8 minus 2 divided by 5 minus 3, if I'm considering the y values and then the x values subtracted. This looks like 6 divided by 2, or in other words, 3. The slope of this line is 3. So if I'd like to use the point-slope formula now, I can, because I don't have the slope, I'm sorry, I don't have the y-intercept, so I can't use the slope-intercept form of the equation, but I can use the point-slope form of our linear equation. So I can start with y minus 2 equals 3 for m times x minus 3. Notice I'm using the x and y coordinate from this point, not any others. I could have done the same thing with this equation here and simplify as we go. If we have time, maybe I'll show that example too. So I'm going to clear the parentheses by distributing this 3 in. We now have 3x minus 9. And now I'll add 2 to both sides to isolate the y value. And we're left with y equals 3x minus 7. Now on the right side, you can see that I completed the math uh, using the other coordinate and ended up with the same answer. So it doesn't matter which coordinate you use once you have the slope that's been established. As a side note, we want to ask the question too, does it matter in what order you subtract the x and y coordinates when establishing the slope, when I establish the slope back here? And remember, the answer to that is no. We talked about this yesterday. Only uh, The only part that matters is that you subtract in the same order within the numerator and denominator. All that matters is that you subtract in the same uh, direction or order in the numerator and denominator. By that I mean uh, if you subtracted 8 minus 2 with the y's in the numerator, then you better subtract 5 minus 3 with the x's in the denominator. <clears throat> if you chose to subtract 3 minus 5 for your x values in the denominator, then you better subtract 2 minus 8 for the y values in the numerator. That's what we mean by order mattering.
Moving on, to summarize what we've talked about so far this week, there are three different types of linear equations that we see in Algebra 2. We have the slope-intercept form, the point-slope form, and we even saw the standard form, sometimes called the general form. Um, we don't often solve uh, in the general form, but we're sometimes given that information from time to time, and we uh, transform it into point-slope or slope-intercept form. We like to use the slope-intercept form when you know the slope of the equation and its y-intercept. We'll use the point-slope form of an equation when you uh, know the slope and any other point that's not on the y-axis. And what's convenient about this, too, is that you can calculate the slope using the slope uh, formula. Finally, standard and general form. I'm not 100% sure when we, would, when we would use that in graphing, uh, but we'll encounter this with problem solving from time to time. And strictly speaking, A, B, and C are going to represent real numbers, and A and B cannot both be zero at the same time. Either A or B must be positive. But we'll only recognize that when uh, we're in a problem-solving process or if we're solving a system of linear equations, which will come in a later unit in this class. We have an example here that's a real-world situation. We'd like to see if we can model it with a linear equation. Um, we recognize that the number of times that a cricket will chirp depends upon the temperature. So when the temperature is 45 degrees, a cricket chirps uh, 20 times per minute. So I might report that as a coordinate, 45, 20. 45 is our independent variable, and 20 is our dependent variable. As temperature, as temperature changes, that will affect the number of times that the cricket will chirp, but not vice versa. The other coordinate might be this one. When it's 90 degrees outside, the temperature is, I'm sorry, the number of chirps is uh, 240. Well, now we have two data points, and I think we can establish a linear equation that models this data. So question A, if I use the point-slope formula, and I'll use this coordinate for the point, um, we would say that y minus 20 is equal to some m value times x minus 45. Now the value we need here, of course, is our slope, so I got ahead of myself a little bit, but that's okay. We can come over here and calculate slope. The slope would be the difference in our y values. I'll take 240 minus 20 and divide that by 90 minus 45. To me, that looks like 220 divided by 45. And I can't really simplify that in my head, so I'll go to the calculator here. 220 divided by 45. If I just press Enter, that calculator should reduce for us, and we get 44 ninths. If I wanted the decimal, I could do that too. I can press Control Enter and obtain the decimal. 4.8 repeating, it appears. So we might call this 4.888. I'll round it to the fourth place. 4.8889. Okay, so I'm going to call this 44 ninths for right now. Let's go ahead and uh, clean up this equation. Now, if I'm being perfectly honest, this kind of does answer question A. Um, we were asked to establish a linear equation. It doesn't say what type. Uh, this is technically just fine. This is the point-slope form of a linear equation. But if we wanted to take it a little bit further and, and write it in slope-intercept form, we can do that too. We'll start by clearing the parentheses by distributing. I want 44 ninths times x. Well, that's easy to do. 44 ninths times x is 44 ninths x. But I also need 44 ninths to multiply by 45. So I'll take that number, 44 ninths, multiply it by, um, I forgot my number again, negative 45, times negative 45, and I get negative 220. Now finally, to isolate the y value, we'll add 20 to both sides of the equation, and that leaves us with 44 ninths x, this time uh, minus 200. 
negative 220 plus 20 is minus 200. And now we have an equation in slope-intercept form. This is helpful for us because now we can answer the question, how many chirps would you expect to hear if the temperature is 70 degrees? Well, temperature is our independent variable. Number of chirps is our dependent variable. So we can report that the number of chirps, y, would be equal to 44 ninths times 70 degrees temperature minus 200. Using our calculator, we can obtain that result pretty easily as well. 44 ninths times 70 minus 200 is this value here. Now that's not very meaningful for me, 1,280 divided by 9. So I'll press Control Enter and I'll get a result here of about 142.2 chirps per minute. For question C, we now know that the temperature is 100, and, I'm sorry, the number of chirps per minute is 120, and we would like to know what the temperature is, 44 ninths x minus 200. So I'm running out of room, let's see if I've got more space over here. Let's move that over. So in order to isolate x, we'll add 200 to both sides. We have 320 equals 44 ninths times x. To move this fraction, we could divide both sides by 44 ninths, or we can multiply by 9 over 44. We talked about this technique in class. It's the reciprocal of the original function. So I'll multiply both sides of the equation by 9 over 44. And that should leave x by itself. This and this will cancel. X is equal to 9 over 44 multiplied by 320. And I'll go ahead and grab the decimal value here. That's 65.45 degrees. I'll go ahead and round it to 65.5 degrees. So having the linear equation here is nice to work with. Um, we can now solve the equation forwards and backwards for different components as needed. And we'll talk a little bit more about how this plays into um, functions versus relations. We'll spend some time to, uh, talking about that in class, but for this video I think this is a good stopping point for now. Additionally, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the graph of this function, but I'm going to save this for class. I don't think I can... Um, clearly explain myself and talk about our units of measure in an appropriate amount of time here in this video. So we'll save that for a class and um, we'll talk about it when I see you um, later this week. Now the final point that I want to make before I wrap up this video, we already talked a little bit about parallel lines and perpendicular lines that was defined right at the beginning. But what's that going to look like for us in terms of uh, the work that we're doing in this class? Well, what I would like for you to notice is that Parallel lines, as we said, are in the same plane and they never touch or cross one another. These slopes, if I were to measure and calculate the rise and run for each of these pairs of graphs, will end up being exactly the same. On the other hand, the slopes of a perpendicular pair of equations will be opposite and reciprocals of one another. And this math starts to describe that. Of course, we'll save that for class two. The bell rang, and I've got to get back to work. Thanks for watching.